Mark Jacobson is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. We're doing a series of interviews on his plans for wind, water, and solar uh, to basically electrify global economies by mid-century, if not earlier. And now we're going to talk about Canada and the, the plan that his team has developed for, for our country. So welcome to the interview, Mark. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mark. Well, this is a very timely conversation to have because uh, we, you know, we have 10 provinces and three territories. They all have uh, their own power grids. They're essentially like little islands. There's, we trade north and south with you folks down in the States. We do not tra trade much east and west. And our new prime minister, Mark Carney, has said, look, we need a national power grid. We need to both make it trade east and west, but we need to maybe double and even triple its capacity so that we can electrify the Canadian economy over time. And that sounds like it might be consistent with the plan that your team has developed for Canada. Um, yeah, that's not a bad idea because you know, the more interconnected regions are in a country or states are in a country, provinces, the easier it is to balance supply with demand, especially if, because you're, you know, if it's even if, if you have a lot of wind and solar on the grid in particular, uh, when it's not windy in one place, it's often windy somewhere else and vice versa. And conversely, sometimes it might be windy somewhere, but not sunny or sunny, but not windy. Uh, having an interconnected grid can help smoothen out the overall supply of clean, renewable electricity. What Give us a, an, an outline of your the plan that your team developed for Canada. Well, first, our plan is to electrify all energy sectors. So if you think of Elect, uh, energy is electricity, transportation, buildings, and industry. We'd want to first electrify transportation, buildings, and industry. So transportation, mostly battery electric vehicles, some hydrogen fuel cell for long-distance heavy transport, like long-distance ships and airplanes. Uh, for buildings, you go to electric heat pumps, electric induction cooktops, uh, energy efficiency in buildings, electric appliances for everything. So getting rid of gas in buildings. Uh, for industry, we, for high temperature industrial processes, we use electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heater, heaters, electron beam heaters, electric heat pumps, fire bricks for storing high temperature heat that can also eliminate most of those electric heaters I just talked about. And we'd use intermittent wind and solar and some hydro to uh, provide the heat for, those, for the fire bricks. And then all the electricity in all these cases, and there's some direct heat for some applications, we provide from just wind, water, solar. So onshore, offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants. Well, we wouldn't have concentrated solar in Canada. Um, probably not too much tidal wave, but lots of hydroelectricity. And But existing hydroelectricity, we're not planning to grow the hydroelectricity. And some geothermal and, and solar heat. But you know, the interesting thing is, well, when you electrify and provide the electricity with just wind, water, and solar, as we call it, energy demand goes down a substantial amount because first of all, in, and for five, there are five reasons. I'll mention the first, well, 23% of all energy, and this is end use energy, not primary energy, what we call end use energy, that what people actually use. 23% of all end use energy in Canada is used just to mine, refine and transport fossil fuels and uranium. And in a 100% wind, water, solar world, we don't need that energy. So we have, we just reduced 23% of our energy demand right there. Then another 30% of demand we can reduce simply because electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, mostly, but some hydrogen fuel cell electric are much more efficient than internal combustion engine vehicles. They use battery electrics use about 75% less energy. Uh, electric heat pumps use about 75% less energy than a gas heater for home heating. Uh, electric induction cooktops use 60% less energy than a gas stove. So when you account for all those energy reductions due to electric appliances and machines, you get another 30%. And then there's another uh, six or 7% reduction of demand due to end use energy efficiency and reducing energy use beyond business as usual. So that's a total 60% reduction of demand just by electrifying, providing the electricity with wind, water, and solar. Then how do we get that, that remaining, all that electricity? Well, if you look across all energy sectors and you electrify it, you'll see that Canada already provides about 30% of what we need in 2050 uh, with existing wind, water, solar, mostly water, mostly hydropower, but also there's some wind installed in a tiny, tiny amount of solar. So we need to get that remaining 70%. So that will be mostly onshore and offshore wind, um, this kind of smaller, modest amount of solar, 
PV photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants. And we're not growing hydro here. So it's going to be wind, solar, and what's ex and the existing hydro that will get to us to 100% renewables. You might ask, well, how much land does that take? Well, new solar on rooftops doesn't take up new land. Offshore wind doesn't take up new land. So it's just, it's mostly the onshore wind and that's mostly space in between turbines, but even counting that space and the solar that's not rooftop solar, that's about 0.1% of Canada's land to go to 100% renewables across all energy sectors to eliminate air pollution in the country, to eliminate global warming emissions, to provide energy security for centuries and centuries to come. Just 0.1% of the land. It'll save, it'll reduce annual energy costs by 68% because you have a 60% reduction in the annual energy use and another 15% reduction, 10 or 15% reduction in the cost per unit energy. So you end up with a 68% lower energy costs. And so just to give you some numbers here really quickly, um, you know, in, 20, in 2050, if you in a business as usual case, Canada would be paying $285 billion per year in energy. But with a wind water solar case, it goes down to around $90 billion per year. So that's almost on the order of $200 billion per year savings. The capital cost is about $573 billion up front, but a $200 billion a year per savings in energy costs with $573 billion up front capital costs, that's almost less than a three-year payback time uh, to transition to 100% renewables across energy sector, all energy sectors. But on top of that, there's a social cost savings that's huge uh, because you know Canada has... So about 4,000 lives per year are lost from air pollution in the, in the country. And then there's also global warming emissions that cause damage. And when you account for the, the health and climate costs on top of the energy costs, uh, the, energy, the health and climate costs are be, beyond the energy costs are about $600 billion per year. And so you eliminate that to zero. So you have about a, close to a 90% reduction in in so what's called social costs due to transition. So it's less than a one-year payback time in terms of social costs, less than a three-year payback time in terms of energy costs. So it's a no-brainer. That's uh there's just it's only benefit. People save huge amounts of money, hardly use any land, reduce health damage, reduce climate damage, even though people don't want to talk about climate damage a lot. <laughs> That's still gonna do it. And you're gonna provide energy security because it's you don't have to import any fuels and it's not necessary to mine any more fuels for energy. Well, we are talking about climate change, of course, because Canada's boreal forest is burning up. We're sending our smoke down to you. Uh, so, you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, there's all sorts of climate damage occurring. I mean, we saw this last week with floods in uh, Texas that were enhanced by global warming. We've seen forest fires uh, and, da and fires in general, not only forest fires, but just wildlife like the Malibu burned up because of dry season that was earlier, et cetera. Just huge amounts of damage due to global warming already. I want to talk to uh, you about the difference between electricity uh, and energy. And this is a point that was made. Uh, we did an interview with uh, Professor Nick Eyre from Oxford, who has done some, you're probably familiar with his work. Probably, he, maybe he copied your work. I don't know. But his point was that when you electrify an economy, your electricity use goes up enormously. You go to double, triple, maybe even more but your actual energy use goes down because the electric technologies, as you pointed out with heat pumps and EVs and so on, is so much more efficient that it actually needs less energy to get the job done, to do the demand, the work that is demanded. And, and so uh, in the context of Nick's work, your uh, forecast, your modeling makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we've done that calculation for Canada. In fact, yeah, we've, did, did that type of calculation starting back in 2009 when we did our world plan. But for Canada, as I mentioned, your, the overall energy is going to go down 60% energy demand, but all that remaining energy will be electricity. And so we calculate that you'll have about 40% higher electricity use because your total energy is going down so much. Like in the US right now, on average worldwide, about 20% of all end use energy is electricity and 80% is not electricity. So if you took that number, let's say you started with 100 units of energy, went down 60%, that goes down to 40 units. So instead of uh, having 100 units, you need 40 units of energy. Instead of having 20 units of electricity, now you have 40 units of electricity. So you've doubled your electricity in that case. 
and you have 60% less overall energy. Now, in the case of Canada, there's a higher fraction of electricity initially, and so it's only a 40% increase in electricity, but it's a 60% decrease in overall demand. I, I want to put tell a, an anecdote here because we live on Vancouver Island, which is on the West Coast, just you know, like uh, where you, just up the road from you, as it yeah. were, and. You know, so we have a temperate climate, it's true. But in the wintertime, it does get pretty chilly. You know, it's uh, uh, high humidity uh, and wet is colder. I can now, as an old prairie boy, I can vouch for that. But here's my point. Uh, we bought a house five years ago and it's not that big. It's 1,300 square feet, but it's well insulated and it's not drafty. It's well sealed. And we put in a heat pump uh, four years ago. And Mark, I have to tell you, because a lot of people are going to be watching this thing and be going, you know, listening to your numbers and then be going, pfft. You know, that just sounds too fantastic. Our heat pump, which we replaced the gas furnace, uses so little electricity to give us both heat and air conditioning in the summertime that I can't even see it in my electric bill. When I go look at the data, I can't tell the difference between one year from, you know, the, the pre-heat pump year from the from the heat pump years. And then we added a, we you know, our gas water heater went, so we got an electric water heater. And it added almost no demand, no draw on the. So our bill maybe over the, you know, went up $15 but between adding a heat pump and a, an electric water heater. Our, our house is now fully electric. And that speaks to the efficiencies that are there to be had. It's a real world example, but it's until you see it yourself with your own eyes and it's come, the money's coming out of your pocket, it's almost hard to believe. Oh, no, I agree with you. That's, I think a lot of people have seen that. And yeah, I, had, I put an electric home up myself in 2017. And since then, I've not paid an electric bill because I have solar on the roof that's powering all that. I haven't paid a gasoline bill because I have electric cars and I have not paid a fossil gas bill for a home. So no energy, no utility bills in eight years. And that's because of the efficiency of electricity, uh, because of, and also good insulation helps too the efficiency of heat pumps, the efficiency of electric induction cooktops, the efficiency of electric vehicles too, don't use much energy compared to gasoline vehicles. So all these things, yeah, you have to see it for yourself to believe it, but more and more people are seeing this. And as a result, there is a rapid change going on uh, throughout much of the world. Of course, then there are people who are against it, usually the people who are invested in the current infrastructure, they don't wanna see it, they don't wanna believe it, but and they'll try to convince others otherwise, but I don't believe those people. Well, I have experience with that. I mean, we've been around, the energy media has been around for 17 years. We've been involved in the Alberta energy conversation, the Canadian energy conversation for a long time. And I run into people who should know better, you know, people like former grid, uh, electric system operator, grid managers, those kind of people. Engineers are the bane of my existence because they keep telling me what can't be done and it's already being done, you know, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And it's the where I'm going with this is that there is a powerful political narrative in Canada that electricity, uh, electro technologies don't work. They're unreliable. They're unstable. They're they're costly. They need fossil fuel backup, and on and on. And yet the experience outside of Canada puts the lie to that argument. Yeah. Well, even in California, I mean, we've been growing renewables like mad and batteries and solar. I mean, we have. In the last two years, solar has gone up about 40%. Batteries have gone up 215%. Gas has gone down 40% on the main grid. And yet we haven't had a blackout on the grid since August of 2020. So that's five years. And so no, and in fact, it's what's called the spot price of electricity has decreased. And the spot price tells you, like if you have a high spot price, that means it's hard to meet demand. So you need some backup. Well, the spot price, and when I looked at it from 23 to 24, it went down 50% in one year. And due to the more reliability of having batteries plus solar and wind on the grid. And so, yeah, it's just a total myth that's been pervaded around that uh, renewables cause instability. In fact, there are 11 states in the U.S. that have 50 to 120 percent of their demand met by just wind, water, solar renewables. But the cost of electricity in those states, uh, 10 out of the, those 11 states, the cost of electricity is more than 1.9 cents a kilowatt hour below the national average. So those are the cheapest electricity states are the ones with the most wind, water, solar. Now there are two exceptions. Well, there's one exception in the top 11, including Maine, uh, but California is number 12 and California has high price of electricity, but nothing to do with renewables. Uh, it has to do with the fact that 
transmission line sparks have caused wildfires for the last seven years that have caused huge devastation that the costs are passed on to consumers. It's caused by the Aliso Canyon and San Bruno gas disasters that one blew up a whole section of a town. And uh, the requirement to strengthen underground gas lines as a result, the requirement to put a lot of transmission lines underground, uh, keeping the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant open, that's been passed on to customers, uh, the cost of upgrading transmission. So you have all these reasons of where we have higher prices and nothing to do with renewables. If renewables weren't on the grid, if we didn't have more renewables, the price would even be higher than this. So there's the only evidence we see is that renewables are reducing the cost of electricity and we expect so because there's no fuel cost for renewables. Solar is free, wind is free. Um, so whereas fossil fuels, you've always got to pay for fuel. Uh, I'm going to want to close the interview with this question, Mark. And that is, we are fond of saying here at Energy Media that electricity is basically the foundation of the 21st century economy. And those countries that are slow to electrify are going to pay for it. Uh, they may not be paying for it now, but they will because they will be less competitive than those who do electrify and become lower cost and more efficient. Would you agree or disagree? Oh, yeah. I mean, the only way to go is electrification. So much more efficient. It's cleaner. It's going to be cheaper. And so yeah, those countries that electrify faster, they're going to have a lot more money to spend on improving the rest of their economy and their livelihoods. Whereas countries that stick with fossil fuels, we're doomed to, to be, you know, slow down and we'll be stuck in the past and we're not going to have as many benefits and we'll, we'll have a lot more deaths due to combustion from fossil fuels, the pollution, uh, we'll be causing more climate damage, we'll be using more land and uh, more resources will be needed to keep this going. Well, Canadians, uh, you, you heard it here first. Actually, you didn't, but, you know. <laughs> It, we, we, we beat this drum a lot. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for this. Yeah, thanks, Markham.